The best time to write. The best time to write. The best time to write. Is now. Is now. Now. The best place to write. The best place to write. The best place to write is here. Is here. Is here. The best person to write. The best person to write. The best person to write. Is you. Is you. Is you. All right, we're going to get our first uh, presenter up here tonight. Uh, she's an emerging Cleveland author, a new voice in the lit activist scene. Uh, she was the 2017 Grand Tournament Storyteller Champion. So if you would please welcome to the sidewalk, Aurora Stone Melvin. I like stories. Hi, guys. Um, first, I want to thank Writing Nights. This is just totally awesome. I'm really glad to be here, and uh, I'm glad you guys are all here. And, uh, and yeah. Can everybody hear? Yeah, how's that? You in the back, go like that or something if you can't hear. Yeah, wait, no, don't go like that. Do something. Be like... Um, so, uh, I have got a short story here. Um, mostly fiction. And uh, I was doing some edits on it this morning, but my computer broke, and so some of the tense is wrong. And anyway, if you see me tripping up, it's just because this is new, and you guys are the first audience to uh, hear Woo! New it. shit! Woo! <laughs> yeah, for new shit. All right. <laughs> Signal fire. On the day after their mother died, Ezra began in earnest the job of tracking his sister down. As his mother slid past recognition, had evolved into a stranger, had stared blank-eyed and open-mouthed at a spot on the wall that appeared unremarkable to Ezra, and he had examined that very spot with his mother over many nights that the lamplight barely kept out the entitled darkness, he had often thought of his big sister, Miriam. She played a greater part in their lives, the lives of his family, and himself and in the life of the declining elderly woman than she deserved. Ezra did not expect her to make it to the funeral, but he felt a sense of urgency nonetheless. It wasn't until he tried to track her down that he realized how far from him she was and he began to worry. Miriam had visited last winter as she usually did. Her black hair buzzed short with a flurry of presents for the kids Discs of pictures of her travels for Ezra and his wife. They would spend a night making ethnic food and watching slideshows while Miriam narrated where she had been. Here is the monastery abbey from the ocean. On the stone's pull-down projector screen, Gampo Abbey resembled the rocks it clung to. Squat conifers buoyed against the Atlantic's winds. Even Miriam seemed weather-worn after her stay, though inwardly lit as she used her arms to describe the shambolic message of the wise warrior. She flipped the picture and a bright red cottage came into view on the edge of the sputtering ocean. A cottage that Ezra would expect from the Nova Scotia countryside. The chimney pipe, a small metal roof, white trim peeled from nailed down shutters. For hurricane season, Marion said. It was not so hard for her to stay silent when the wind would take her words if she tried to speak, she exclaimed and within the gold filigree gods and goddesses, sounds of clustered bells, <coughs> air of musky reservations, made speech nearly abhorrent. She did not mention the scratchy blankets, the moths with mouthfuls of wool that adorned the walls. Becky, Ezra's wife, a tall, meek woman, oud and odd, the kids sat transfixed, their new singing bowls lay silently in their laps. Ezra had to leave halfway through, telling Ezra had to leave halfway through to go roll their mother, as someone had to do every few hours to prevent bed sores from developing on her deflated body. Bed sores developed anyway, but they were manageable. Do you want a hand, Miriam offered, looking compromised, like she hoped he would say no? They walked from the living room through the dim dining room, where the remnants of the serving dishes cluttered the tablecloth, the candles burned low, letting the walls delphic shadows. He paused to blow the candles out as he walked past. Miriam ran her fingers down the wall in the hallway, counting the doors until they got to the last closed one. Ezra, out of custom, knocked with two fingers. There was no sound from within. He opened the door slowly and they entered slower still. She lay with her back to the intruders, their mother, the sleeping dead, 
dressed in a ridiculous nightgown with lacy trim, sprinkled with minuscule butterflies, pink and yellow. In your Sunday best, Mother Miriam said, and she was instantly sorry, for the silence of the room had been the only reverent thing. But Ezra appreciated the comment, took it as a compliment that Miriam had noticed the special gown. Usually, Mother was a much drab or darker ensemble that hid the stains well and were easier to manage, having no buttons and no form. She did look some like her old self with the makeup Sharon had applied earlier, along with the curlers. Hello, Mom, Ezra said. It's not like she can hear us, said Miriam. You don't know that, said Ezra. The old woman's face hung off her skull, allowing for a smile, unmoving, but a smile of some kind, as if someone was setting fire to her toes. This was her face now. Ezra reached for a clean sheet from the shelf piled with these and other necessities. Diapers, ointment, feeding tubes, wet wipes, gowns, splash plaids, Clorox, bleach. He began to feed the folded white sheet under his mother's belly, where her belly had been. Now she was skin and bones, as they say, or bones draped with brittle cloth that had once been skin. Miriam grabbed the other end of the sheet as instructed and tugged and gently, as instructed. Something velvety and bone cold brushed against Ezra's wrist, and he started, letting go of the sheet swiftly, bumping into the shelf behind him, and the loaded shelf began to sway. Miriam had been horrified, not sure where to run in the tiny room, but the shelf stood, and they looked at each other over the bed. Now she laughed quietly, close call. She gave her brother that look like she would when they were younger, and hiding under the living room table below the tablecloth long after they were supposed to be asleep in their bedroom. She gave him the quizzical, what now, look that had sent him on those nights when he would undoubtedly cough or do something else to give them away. He was always giving her plans away. She had wanted to run away one time, had packed a backpack loaded with clothes and food and an electric blanket, had drawn a map to where she'd be making camp so that he could follow her when the time was right. But Ezra had become so worried that something would happen to her that he had spilled the beans, saying, Sissy is going to get eaten by a wildcat in tears before she had gotten halfway down the driveway. It had been one of those times she hadn't talked to him for days. Not until some other fanciful escape or punishment forced the siblings together. When she would refuse to talk to him, those were the worst. She would pretend he was the wind or a cricket. She would say, does anyone hear that? It must be the river. It would drive Ezra into anguished remorse. He would fall to the ground and beg for attention, grabbing at her skinny shins. Oh, all right, Miriam would say. Ezra bent over his mother and realized that her medical dog tag necklace was hanging down inside her gown, looped over the rema remains of one breast. The fallen bulge, and it tickled his skin, causing a start. He laughed at himself, but he couldn't forget the uncanny instance. Ezra and Miriam rolled her cautiously, and then Ezra changed the woman's diapers while Miriam expected the picture of the cottage, the other pictures on the walls of her and Ezra in their 20s, at the lake of one of the kids at Tom's 4th of July reunion. She squinted and bent over, trying to get a better look. A postcard-sized photo hung in a cheap frame. Is that us? A young woman with hair that fell across her eyes like falling water held two small children in the photograph, both in dresses of some sort, dark-haired little children, squinting, holding the woman, holding. The woman knelt and held them. They both watched her, looking surprised, ignoring the photographer. Miriam remembered that day very suddenly amid the tangle of nondescript flash frames that had become her early memories. Here and there, a large yellow moon or a fierce black dog stuck out, but it was a jumble of being much shorter than things, and wary, and frightened, and comforted, and being part of something, being part of a body rather than a solitary and wind-blown body, being the one wrapped in arms, peering out, her mother's hot breath and large pores, pure and flimsy joy, candy from little glass jars on glass top tables, and stringy spring sunlight and grandmother coming to visit. They straightened the house together and wore sunbonnets picked out just for the occasion, which they had taken off for the picture, their hair strangely must as if they had just gotten out of bed. There was the tinge of whatever that feeling is that is childhood, the joyful anxiety, that fearful feeling Miriam is always left with when remembering, the feeling of half-forgotten and first tries 
and being human before she had heard of death, though even without a name, she knew about death. Death was there in the shadows and cracked closet door and the absence of father and mother's fits and everything unexplainable. Miriam decided later that humans are made for death and babies are too, they just can't name it. Made in the shape of life, but like puzzle pieces to snuggle death, to spoon perfectly the great nothing and the inconceivable beyond. Miriam felt like a woman with no muscles, no organs, no core, as she looked at the photo and she turned away, wrapping her arms around her chest. See, it has all come to pass, she wanted to say. See, mama is dying and we will be left alone and very soon the shadows will take you from me and then take me from me and then most frightening of all, there will be a world without me in it. She wanted to explain herself to her brother, but she didn't. She wiped the dust from the picture with the corner of her shirt sleeve and righted the flame on the wall. She leaned in to kiss her mother on the forehead when she left the room, but afraid of what she would taste, of what her lips would confront, instead she tucked the blankets up to the distorted chin and sort of patted her head like someone would a dirty puppy. Good night, mummy, sleep tight. Who is saying these words? It is not me, the child. It is not me, the woman. Whose corpse is this I bid good night to, whose heartbeat is all that is left of a body song, of my mother's body song? Hello? The voice sounds as far away as it is. Ezra imagines someone has answered a payphone beneath a waterfall. This is what the space sounds like. Hello, this is Ezra Ratner. I'm looking for Miriam, my sister. Our mother has passed away. Only the river noises for a moment, and then a man says, well, how nice to hear from you. I'm sorry to hear about your mother. Miriam is not here, but let me get Peggy. Okay. This is a similar conversation to the two farms before this and countless friends of his sisters he is called. Apparently, Miriam is off woofing, they call it, flopping from farm to farm, helping with chores, fixing cars, eagerly laying shingles on chicken coop roofs for room and board. The children like to hear about the farms at dinner, and Ezra, his large, childlike face that can't be helped even with the beard he is trying to muster, makes up details, such as what the barns look like, <coughs> about the rowdy crew of interns Miriam bunks with. Although he guesses he is not far from the truth, he doesn't really know these things. All he knows is he is chasing some kind of ghost, and he doesn't know why she has become a ghost to him, and he doesn't know what he needs from her. He feels this in a familiar way, as if they were always doing this, he and Miriam. One is running and one is skipping to catch up. She is always running and he gave up long ago, yet here he is. This is a man calling himself Ratner, says he's Miriam's brother, their mother has died. He can hear the man talking to someone, faint, and the connection seems to fade in and out with tapping like an old typewriter. Hello, a woman's bright voice comes over the lines. Ezra introduces himself again. Oh honey, I'm so sorry for you both. This is more along the lines of what he expected to hear. The last several places he called talked to him like he was lying, unwanted, at fault. He began to wonder, what is Miriam up to? The woman is saying, I wish I could help you out, and his heart falls. We love Miriam, what a good worker, and so wonderful with the goats. Ezra prepares for the lead to go dead, for this woman to tell him she has no idea where Miriam is or is headed. I wish I could get her for you right now, but she has gone into town and won't be back until tonight or even tomorrow. Did he hear correctly? She is still there? We have been searching for weeks. Yes, yes, says the remote voice, the wholesome and beloved voice. After he hangs up the receiver, he sits at the table for a minute, running his fingers around in curly cues on the polished, honey-glossed wood. He can hear his own breathing, the sound of breath running across the hairs in his nose, breath channeling through tongue and teeth and lips, breath pooling places. Was that his heartbeat? No, no, it was the cat pawing across the polished floor. Why do I want Miriam to come back, he asks himself again, seeking a name, a definition. What is he yearning for? He guesses he wants her to become like she was to him, more than she is or was or can be. He wants her to say, Jesus Christ, she is gone, we are all alone, we are next. Hold on, I am coming to you, we will batten the hatches, we will fortify the walls. We will take our vitamins and revert to being children and juice and give up red meat and never get old together and maybe death will forget about us. Don't you worry, baby brother, I'll make death forget about us. 
She is all that stands between me and my turn, he thinks. My turn to be over. But that is foolish. I will keep being the full center of a new family I have built around me to cover the void of the first. No one knows he is a stand-in, that their center of gravity was really from another universe, one that imploded when Mother died. They are specks of dust attached to other specks of dust and everybody is being flung through space. Who will tell the children that gravity is a guess? Ezra? The line is filled with blissful rapids and rivulets. Miriam? Yes, it's me. What's going on? She's gone. There is no pause. Her answer runs over his words. Mom? She's been gone. And then after some time of listening to the water that is the sound electricity makes when captured, she says, I'm sorry that she's gone, but it's been so long since she was with us. And I'm not sad to let her body go. She was just holding you back. Ezra is dumbfounded. He stares at the nothing in between him and the wall, but it was his iron center, his mother's molten and core, that let him risk it all to make another human, to love that human despite death. Mother's roots, however elusive, kept him from disappearing and allowed him to fortify his knowledge and existence with material and human wealth despite the obvious yet often hidden realization that nothing is permanent and why bother? Mother's silent, beating heart, even after her mouth had stopped speaking, after her arms had stopped holding, had been a signal fire. I'll be home for Christmas, baby brother, Miriam says before hanging up the phone. I'm glad I still have you, she says. Miriam hangs up the house phone on the planet Earth, heads back to her safe hammock, and looks up to a storied sky at which coyotes sing to extinguish the scars, stars which scare them. Ezra hangs up the phone, unsure of how to set his face, looks to his knees, to the place on his knees where his jeans are giving out from roughhousing and gardening and reaching for forks and toys that get stuck in impossible places. He looks to his sneakers, the one untied, but he has no will to correct this. Struck by the fact that mountains and mothers never choose to be such and are only seen as mountains or mothers when held up to the fields of grasses and forget-me-nots and other smaller, lighter beings. Writing nights. Writing nights. Writing nights.